Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for all coming at 9 o'clock, uh, first thing of our annual meeting of new champions, and so welcome to everyone. My name is Alex Wong with the World Economic Forum, and I'm uh, very pleased to make a brief introduction to the session. Um, I oversee our initiative at the Forum called the Global Strategic Infrastructure Initiative. We've been spending the last three years uh, focusing on this very important topic. Uh, the very various work streams include, first of all, a series of knowledge reports on how to do everything from prioritize and select infrastructure to how to create PPPs, to how to operate and maintain, and how to finance. So we have a whole series of reports, and I have a couple here. Uh, secondly, we have a whole work stream on creating uh, working groups between business and government and the MDBs, the Multilateral Development Bank community, to see if we can actually demonstrate uh, infrastructure project implementation, and including a very deep work stream in Africa, uh, working in partnership with the African Development Bank, the NEPAD agency, and the African Union Commission. And finally, we have a very dedicated track, which is part of this session, uh, related to all of the challenges uh, on advancing infrastructure financing. So how do you actually get that, uh, that 60 odd trillion dollars worth of money floating around in institutional investors and pension funds, insurance companies, more directed to infrastructure investments? And uh, we're very excited in this regard to uh, have this session go deeper into this particular topic, but in general overall. And in that regard, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, uh, Vikram Sangra from NDTV, who will uh, lead us through the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here in Cancun with all of you. And uh, we have a great panel here who's going to help us really understand what we can do to get infrastructure moving. Infrastructure is clearly one of the most important requirements for countries across the world, not just the frontier markets or the less developed world, also the global emerging economies. And increasingly, I have to say, many of the advanced economies also today have just what are the problems? Is it government policy? Are there things that governments and countries can do to attract more investment and to get infrastructure doing better? Is that the problem? Is it the problem that funds are not available, that uh, capital structures are inadequate? Do we need more innovation? Those are some of the issues that we're going to try and tackle during the course of uh, the next hour or so. And what we are going to do is we're going to leave this as a rather free-reading session of brainstorming, if you like. So perhaps through a discussion in this rather individual and right, uh, arrive at some of the answers. Um, let me start off by, by welcoming our, our panelists, and it's a, it's a privilege, sir, to have you with us. Uh, president Keita, who's the President of the Republic of Mali, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Mark Nation is the President of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board Asia. Uh, uh, we'll be trying to get some sense of where the hub and how the money can come in. Uh, Christian Jacques is the Executive Vice President of SNC Laval Group uh, in, of France. And, um, Shoji Takanaka is the Global Vice President, Smartkin Community Division at the Toshiba Corporation in, in Japan. So thank you all so much for being with us. Um, President Keita, why don't I start off with you? Uh, if, you look at, if you look at Africa, look at Asia, so many countries around the world lack the most basic of infrastructure. And it's not just the flyovers and the expressways, infrastructure all the way down to drinking water, to sanitation, to toilets. Th those are some of, the, some of the most basic of infrastructure that's still missing. What can countries do differently? Merci beaucoup. Uh, je voudrais d'abord remercier... Well, infrastructure is a very important topic, in particular in Africa. Today, everybody pays a lot of attention to this topic. But, dear friends, infrastructure is a core issue for all of us. In Dhaka, Senegal, most of the attention goes to infrastructure. There are serious problems in financing infrastructure projects in energy, transportation, environment. That is to say, 
Only with money can we proper, properly deal with this infrastructure issue. So financing is really a key issue for us. We need billions of dollars of money to build up infrastructure. Now we need 45 billion US dollar, which is a great deal of money. But a fundamental issue still lies in the energy sector. The key issue for us is the shortage of energy and shortage of investment. If there is not enough energy, it's almost impossible to have advancement for any country. If there is no transportation infrastructure, even if you transport your goods to the port, it cannot transport those goods into hinterlands. Now we have been clearly aware of this problem. So Africa needs to establish a effective mechanism to rise to this challenge, which is to finance these infrastructure projects. Mr. President, uh, Mark, if I can, if I can take that, that to you then. So a lot of money is required, $35 billion. So if you take, you would take the number of projects that need to be rolled out. It's a great deal of money. Potentially, could also mean a great deal of profit for somebody. Why is it that it's, it, I mean, it should be therefore very simple. There is large pools of capital which are lying around, uh, which are not getting that high interest rates. It should be possible to deploy them. But it's not quite as simple as that, is it? Yeah, so step back for a second and look at the role of the international investors uh, like ourselves, uh, just to understand the challenge. And I think if you look from our perspective, we, we have a responsibility, the Canada Pension Plan, for example, has a responsibility to our 18 million beneficiaries and contributors to maximize the returns on our investments without undue risk of loss. And that it's as simple as, as simple as that. So different sovereign wealth funds and pension funds have slightly different nuance and variation around that, but essentially their goal is to find the best investments risk adjusted around the world. So every time there's an opportunity to invest in an infrastructure project in a country, we look at it versus the opportunity to invest in infrastructure projects anywhere else in the world. Um, and also we look at it versus investing in anything else that we could invest in, whether it's private equity or it's public markets. Um, and so that, that's, that's the challenge that we face. We need to find the best risk-adjusted returns globally. So I think the challenge for governments is to provide the framework that it actually creates competitive risk-adjusted returns for investors. Uh, because while the, the projects clearly have an enormous amount of social good to the countries concerned, which is, which is you know, helpful for investors to know they're <coughs> investing in something that's worthwhile, ultimately they're looking at the financial returns. So that, that's the challenge, is to create the framework that for very long-term investments, create a stable, predictable uh, regulatory environment and uh, returns for investors. So in most cases, what's the bigger problem? That the risks are too high or that the returns are too low? Uh, I mean, of, often it's the risks are unquantifiable and that, that's the challenge. It's, it's that there, there's risk that is difficult to put a number on, that, that whether it's uh, an unpredictability of the particular projects, that how much usage is the project going to get and who's going to own that risk, or it's an unpredictability of the, uh, the whether it's the tax regime around the project um, or, the, uh, or the concession agreements. So it's, it's that that in, in, I think, for countries that are just starting a, a development program of infrastructure, that, that's the challenge. Right. When, when you're looking at it from the point of view of, of being a developer, uh, those risks, are, is, that, is that what worries you the most, that we're not quite sure what the risks are that we're going to get in here? We like this project, we'd like to do it, you know, th there's clearly a requirement for these infrastructure projects. 
but who knows what's going to happen. The government may change its mind. Something dramatic could happen on the ground. I would say yes and no. Uh, I, I think we are, while developing projects, we are spending a lot of time to try to find together mechanism, together, I mean, with, with the public, between the public and the private sector, to try to find mechanism to mitigate the risk that we can anticipate. And, and I think one of the difficulties, as you said, is what I call non-Excel risk, is the risk that you cannot put on the Excel file and on any model. <clears throat> and I think probably what is, what is really missing in all this project is at the early stage of the project, we should probably spend a week together, meaning the public, the financial party, and, and the developers, <clears throat> the engineering or the equipment supplier, and say exactly what are the risks that we are ready to consider. Uh, for instance, we, we spend a lot of time to, to, um, in, some, in some concession contract to try to have uh, uh, risk uh, being mitigated inside the contract. But, I mean, we have, during the 30 or 35 years of the contract, we have uh, external events coming into the contract that are really not being anticipated and that really <clears throat> not even in the risk mitigation process. So uh, I think the transparency at the early stage of the project, what is the political acceptance of the project? What is the political acceptance of the price to the end user? Uh, what's, what is the expected profit from the company? And when? Is it at the development phase or is it during the uh, execution of the contract? What is the margin of the financial institution? This kind of thing. We spend a lot of time, to me, in the development to hide that and to try to <coughs> put that behind the scene uh, to really avoid the discussion. But I think we should be, if we want to develop partnership, it has to be a transparent partnership. We should say where, where is our margin? What are the risks that we are ready to take? What is uh, the acceptability uh, by the public uh, of the project? And so on and so forth. And we should save a lot of time. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, there is nothing to hide because we, 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 are, we are partner in this kind of concession project. But at the end of the day, that some of the political risks, for example, that you're talking about, you could have a particular government or a particular regime that says, yes, we want to do this, and there could be an election, and a new government comes in and says, we exactly. don't want this. Then what do you do? Exactly. So, so that, that's why, I mean, the, the problem is, is more, the, I mean, the solution, I would say, is more the spirit of the project than really the document. Because we have seen, for instance, in the water business, we have seen projects in South America in the, in the 90s with very good, very clever clauses right, written by the best lawyer in the world saying that prices will be escalated uh, according to Forex. And this is not acceptable by the public. This is not acceptable by any government. So either you have a clause in the contract, but I mean, in terms of return, it means nothing. Uh, so it's more a matter of, of spirit. And to really understand the spirit, that's the reason why I say we need transparency at the early stage of the project. And we, we, in my view, we don't, we don't want to, to hide the basic of each party. What are the fundamentals for us? What are the fundamentals for the public? What, what is a, where where do, we want, do we want to make money? And same for the financial, same for the equipment supplier. And if we spend one week just going through that, I think we will probably save some development cost because, I mean, we will see whether the project is bankable or not because the spirit is bankable more than the document. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to that spirit in just a couple of minutes. So that, let me just get your opening comments on what you think the real problems and issues are. Uh, <clears throat> I think for the infrastructure investment, the original plan is the most important. Uh, from my experience, uh, usually uh, public sector determines everything, uh, the specification and uh, uh, any uh, plan will be decided by the government. But uh, in order to succeed, uh, the functions allocation should be different. Uh, private sector should uh, determine the specification or give some ideas to how to develop uh, the uh, realization of the project. And uh, uh, say PPP or PFI, there are some cases which is very uh, unsuccessful, but uh, uh, to, to understand uh, the private sector's uh, allocation is uh, large. Then, uh, <coughs> anyway, the specification, specification should be determined by the private, private sector, not by the public. In that case, uh, a good idea is coming from the public sectors, uh, 
private sectors, and uh, uh, sometimes it's a very good project, uh, I think. All right. Listen, Kita, l let me come back to you on the point about risk, about the fact that, uh, as he says, you, you said a lot of money is required to build out infrastructure. And if I understood Mark correctly, he said that the money would be ready to come in. But there's always a slight concern about the risk. The, you know, at the end of the day, they are investors. They're looking at the risk reward, risk return ratio. What can countries do to assure investors that their money will be safe, that uh, at the end of the day, there won't be policy flip-flops, changes? Merci bien. Vous savez, un pays comme le mien a des besoins qui peuvent paraître ridicules. À As the other panelists said, the investment in infrastructure is already uh, halfway down. So um, like uh, $5 billion has been made. And we've uh, had some discussion among ourselves. We had our strengths. Our country is not as poor as everyone else thinks it is. So we're actually the third largest gold miner in Africa. We also have a lot of other minerals to offer. So in Africa, we are probably among the uh, richest countries. And we also have a very strong labor force. Our agricultural sector is also very strong. We are next to uh, Niger. And um, in 1939, we already built the uh, Gavara uh, water dam to uh, irrigate the farmland. So uh, about 1 million uh, hectares of the land is uh, properly irrigated. In Mali, we also have other uh, strengths to uh, play to our advantage. Uh, at the political level, uh, for a country like Mali, we are trying to uh, reduce the risk factors for the investors. As uh, I said previously, uh, we've actually uh, convened meetings uh, to talk about uh, project uh, feasibility, how to create a peaceful, uh, safe environment for investors, and also uh, how to develop a vision for the country. So there's a lot of uh, support that Mali is uh, uh, gleaning from around the world. And uh, this will uh, be good for private investment to come in. And private investors are more willing to uh, share the risk. We are also uh, discussing uh, transfers. Uh, and at the society level, uh, we are also doing research. Uh, Say, if we want to build a bridge with Senegal, we see this as a public uh, infrastructure project. So the government needs to uh, chip in. So we had a very extensive discussion in the very early stage. And now the project is uh, going on very smoothly. And we have the willingness to uh, follow through so that the investors will uh, get their returns. That's very critical to us. And investment is still in short supply in Mali. In the energy sector, for example, we welcome very much uh, private investment in our energy, mining, and other sectors. And also the uh, cross-border projects with Senegal, the development along the river, uh, water projects, we are also working with the United States, uh, some of the big, uh, biggest companies from the United States. Uh, also, the WHO uh, and Senegal together are working with us, uh, especially in the area of energy. There's a lot of uh, projects, a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot on our plate. In December, uh, there will be a dam uh, leading to uh, Senegal, which will start, which will break ground uh, in December. 
So we had very uh, good collaboration with Chinese uh, investors and the builders. So we do have uh, uh, some strengths to play to our advantage. So you're talking about there's there's a lot of I mean clearly there are governments who may say that, that look we we want investors to come and we're willing to do uh, whatever it takes. What would you say to to President Keita? What are the sort of things that you'd be looking to hear or to see actually implemented, which makes it much easier to build out infrastructure? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, to, to, to caveat, first of all, before uh, comment, so uh, the Canada Pension Plan, my, my own institution so far, is not invested in, in Africa. And that's not necessarily um, you know, a, a comment on Africa. It's more just a, a statement on the de our development. You know, we're, we're a relatively new institution in terms of doing direct investment. So we've been doing direct investment in-house for the last eight years. Um, so North America, obviously, we started with uh, Europe um, and then developed markets, uh, particularly Australia in, in Asia, is where we, we've um, developed our expertise. So Africa will come in time. So that, that's the first caveat. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I think the, uh, as, as we look at markets uh, like Africa, like Mali, the, is, is, when we do that, the, I think the roles of the... Uh, uh, international development finance, uh, the multilateral uh, agencies have a huge part to play in this. Um, and so uh, whether it's the World Bank or the IFC or the uh, risk insurance and political risk, risk insurance, um, you know, MEGA and others, that, that these can significantly uh, provide comfort for both credit and uh, equity investors uh, in projects. That, that's, that's the first thing I'd say. They clearly have a very big, big part to play. Um, Second thing is, I think the uh, uh, putting where, where if you if countries can put uh, decisions about uh, infrastructure, the concessions, key decisions beyond the reach of uh, political parties and changing political parties. So it requires a very big step to change something. For example, some countries have. Uh, change the constitution to provide protection around certain major infrastructure projects, or they've uh, said that it will require a supermajority vote of you know all houses of parliament or uh, whatever um, you know government there is, and so it, it puts it beyond the reach of um, of normal change of political whim, and I think that that's helpful um, in removing uh, political temptation over, over time to uh, to readjust things. Um, the third thing is fundamentally is uh, developing the, uh, the, the the quality, the maturity, and the independence of the regula regulators. So the authorities that regulate, to the extent that they can be uh, separated from uh, from politics and provided uh, constitutional, statutory strength um, and independence, then again, and, and that clearly takes time, takes years to develop. Uh, that that's very powerful. So, for example, India uh, is the, the National Highways Authority of India. Uh, we, we think is um, is moved towards a lot of uh, best international practices over the last 19, 20 years of its establishment, uh, and gave gave us as CPPIB a lot of comfort when we looked at India and decided to make an investment in uh, in the toll road sector in India. Uh, so that, that that's one example. Right. Um. The, the, the risks, of course, uh, come on both sides also. I and mean, you, you could have major changes taking place even in the companies. Your own company has seen some, some pretty dramatic changes over the last, uh, in the, the recent past. Um, also, what investors want, what companies' own approaches could, could also change. So the risks will happen on both sides. Yes, of course. And, and that's the reason why. Uh, what, one of the uh, things that was mentioned by President is, is very important to me is this kind of sub-region uh, perspective in terms of uh, in terms of development of project because it's it's really creating some dynamic different from the the, the local uh, political institution and creating a bigger picture in terms of risk mitigation and and to us uh, as as uh, private investors this uh, kind of sub-region agreement such as in South Afri South African region or the Mano River as you mentioned, and so on and so forth. It's very good uh, to really 
reinsure the, the, the private investor about the, the political risk and, and any risk mitigant, which is, which is becoming natural between the, the, the partner. Uh, in terms of, uh, so in terms of political change, this is creating some kind of natural risk mitigant. Um, for, for the private sector, I mean, at the end of the day, whatever happened to the financial institution or to the, or to the equity investor, uh, I, mean, it, I mean, it's not re really important because uh, at the end of the day, it's a long-term agreement, long-term project, and it's just a matter of, uh, I mean, it's like a company, I mean, I mean in someone, is, uh, is want to change the shareholding structure. I mean, the project and the value of the project remains. So if the project has a value, uh, there is a great future for the project, whoever are the shareholder. If you just built a project with a kind of, I would say, bad consensus or, or, or weak consensus, then you have difficulties and you might be impacted by changes in the financial institution, in the political part, or in the private sector. But again, if you built the best project, you get the best, invert, best stakeholder into the project from day one up to the end of the project. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's again, it's, uh, it has to be, it's a matter of transparency and a matter of building the best project altogether. All right, so the selection of projects, I want to dwell on that in, some, in, in just a couple of minutes, but one thing which we haven't yet mentioned is the C word, which is corruption. Is that still a big problem, uh, you think, in a large number of countries when you're going into that? You have to pay money, you have to pay bribes, and as a result of that, it's difficult to do business? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, well, concession, is, it's, it's a beauty for that, because, I mean, definitely, uh, to me, concession project is, is out of this corrupted world, uh, because it's, it's, it's obvious that uh, nobody would accept to be corrupted to put their own money in the project. So the, the rationale of a concession project is very different than, than a public awarded project. Uh, and I think we are talking about risk mitigant. Uh, the best risk mitigant against corruption is concession. Because there is no room for corruption in the concession. You are putting your own money, so I mean it's... But somebody could still ask for a bribe to allow the money, the project to proceed. Yeah, you but won't I give mean, permission for it if you don't pay a bribe. I... I, I I think the, the, well, I don't really see the risk because, again, the rationale of such a project is very different. The rationale of the project is that, of, of a concession project, is that you will be long-term local partner. You will not just come into the country to get the project, get the money from the project, and leave the country, as most of the construction companies were doing before. When you, are, when, you are, when you are working on the PFI, or on the PPP and so on, you are in the country for 30, 30, 40 years. So you are part of the local community. Uh, so that's totally different. I mean, it's, it's and, and the, again, the, the allocation of, of, of margin is, is clearly shown in the business plan. So to me, uh, uh, concession is definitely the best risk mitigant against corruption because you become, uh, as, as either as investor or, or as, as, a, as a, um, uh, a lender, you become part of the local community. And you are not there just to get a project and leave the country. You, you are part of the local business community. Right. President Keita, one of the other issues, though, that, that comes up increasingly in many countries is also security. We've, we've seen not just the places where obviously there's a lot of violence uh, taking place even now, but in other, in other areas, including, including your part, part of the world, uh, we've seen these uh, you know, people being kidnapped, held hostage, ransom being asked for. The minute something like that starts to happen, then concessioners or anybody coming to invest in infrastructure start to get a bit concerned. No, we are uh, conscious of all these aspects of risk. You made a very a uh, valid point on security. If a country cannot maintain the security of the country and the security on the project, then it will not work. That is why we put a lot of emphasis on security and fairness and justice. In our system, say in Canada, the regulatory measures are very rigorous. In France, the same. So we are benchmarking towards these countries. 
in establishing our regulatory framework. Say we have a, a government unit that is controlling all government expenditures. So uh, on the regulatory side, we are doing quite well. Uh, say if a Canadian investor comes in and invests in a, a project in Mali, we need to assure the investor that it's safe to invest in the country. We also see political risks. As we have discussed before, in this globalized world, terrorism, the situation in the Middle East, for us, the international politics will have some impact on some regions, for example, Mali. Because in Mali, there is also terrorism, many uh, the problems of Islam, and also some other problems. At present, we have adopted some effective measures, uh, either under the framework of the United Nations or under other frameworks. So we need to make concerted efforts to prevent it from happening. For example, under G5, we have uh, established some mechanism. Uh, of course, our G5 is different from other G countries, uh, and G5 consists of five uh, poor countries. So for us, the key issue is stability. And Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, Mauritania, these five countries. And we have spent lots of efforts ensuring a good investment climate. So we have to make sure that we've got good legal framework for investment, which I think is very, very important. And for us, we have done lots of work in this regard. We have also fought against corruption. It's the same in other areas. We will spare no efforts in doing well in every aspect. At present, some competent authorities are reading through around 2,000 uh, documents on anti-corruption. So the more resolve we have on anti-corruption, the more guarantee we will give to foreign investment. And of course, the foreign investors will see what we are doing. We are very open and flexible to foreign investors. And we will offer some concrete guarantee so as to make sure they've got a good return. Uh, Sai <laughs> oui, bon, euh, en sorte que j'étais un peu partagé entre vous écoutez, vous et... Sir, just now I listened to both your uh, questions in Chinese. So could you repeat your question? Sorry, there's some... So considering uh, terrorism 
Are there any effective measures to, to fight against terrorism? I would say there are risks of terrorism. We do have some measures, and we will take measures to ensure the security of foreign investment. Just now, I touch upon G5, Group of Five, to make concerted efforts to make sure that each and every government can try its best to prevent these risks from happening. And uh, we're also being candid to investors and to tell them the truth. So if we have aware some of the risks, we will tell the investors. So I don't think there is such a thing as absolute security. I just want to turn now to the point of project selection that was being uh, spoken about right now. What sort of projects, have you, when you're looking at an infrastructure project, do you also see which one it is, as was being saying, there are certain projects that are easier, simpler to roll out, no real risk, and so that those are more attractive for that reason? Uh, <clears throat> I'm belonging to the smart community division, and for the, uh, over, over the world, a smart community project will be uh, done right now, but uh, many of them are uh, only the stage of the uh, exploitment, uh, trial project. But anyway, uh, uh, what comes first for the investment? I, I think uh, the key word is safety and security. Uh, for the, uh, I think the scale of the natural disasters is, is uh, increasing every year, especially in Japan, uh, for the flood and the earthquakes and the, uh, volcanoes, explosion, and uh, mm, we have to uh, invest something to uh, uh, pre uh, <coughs> pre prevent from the uh, disasters. But uh, the key word, techni te te technical word, is uh, forecast, predicting. How to, in, in, in advance, how to know the earthquakes and how to uh, know the uh, weather uh, heavy rain is coming from. So uh, the forecast technology will be applied to the uh, natural disasters. It's, it's very applicable, and uh, uh, that kind of investment could be first, I think. And what's more, uh, uh, regarding the healthcare inv investment, uh, if we keep on the, uh, continuing on everyday life as it is, then we will uh, uh, be a serious disaster in that uh, serious disease. Disease in that case, uh, uh, if we could uh, prevent or forecast uh, how to prevent the uh, serious disaster, serious disease, uh, maybe medical costs will be decreasing rapidly, and that kind of investment should be coming first. I think then that this kind of idea uh, will be applied to another country such as Africa and Mali. Is that, is that part of what you were saying? So if, uh, therefore, if there are projects which are to do with technology, to do with disaster prevention, to do with clean drinking water, sanitation, the likelihood of there being too many risks associated with them uh, may be lower than, for example, a highway project where you have to acquire land or mining projects where local communities could get, could get uh, you know, displaced. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I think it's not that simple. I, I mean, it's, and again, our job as, as developer is not to avoid uh, uh, the risk, is to manage the risk. A and it is obvious that the more, I mean, the more risk we, we, we know how to manage, the better is the margin on the project, because the competition is, is lower. Uh, so, so, of course, we, the point is rather to have the right people inside the company, but as well with our partnership uh, to find all the risk mitigant. But to me, the risk is not a, is not a photo, it's more a movie. So what is imp because what is right today is probably not right tomorrow. So to me, the more, most important thing is the dynamic between the various stakeholders. Uh, and if they really want the project because of safety reason or security reason, and because we think that, politically speaking, the leaders of the country want 
need and can convince the people that the project is needed, uh, then we can take more risk because we know that this has value for everybody. If it is easy, well, it's difficult to find out value. It's difficult to find out margin. So, I mean, the, the answer is not that simple. Um, I prefer difficult project where I have the right people to manage all the risk. And when uh, we know the risk, the risks are not hidden. All right, so that's, that's one way of looking at it. Go for the more difficult ones because the margins will be higher out there. Project identification, how important is that? Or you want to respond to what well, you said? Well, I, I was just going to agree wholeheartedly that it, it's, um, it's investing in those projects that are complicated where you have an edge in understanding the risk and where, where you, you understand the risks better than, uh, better than other people. And that, that's, how, uh, you know, that, that's how to make you know, returns in excess of uh, what you could do otherwise. So that, 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 that's the critical thing. So it's exactly what we try to do. Because we have developed in-house uh, in -house capability to um, assess infrastructure projects, to own them for the long term, to manage them for the long term. Uh, we, we, we do think our edge is slightly more complicated <coughs> projects. Um, at the moment, generally, I say in, in more developed markets, but we're also uh, expanding into more developing markets. So you know, the, our recent investment in IDPL with uh, Lusten and Tupro in India um, is uh, reasonably complex the way we've structured that. But the, the more interesting one is in Peru recently where we've invested in uh, the gas pipeline, uh, we call it TGP. Um, where we've made about an $800 million investment in, uh, in one of the, the key trunk gas pipelines in Peru. Um, and that was fairly complicated in how we got to make the investment. Um, there, were, there were a whole series of different transactions that got us to it. Um, but I, so I think that, that, just to resonate that point, I think where we understand, we think we understand the complexities or the risk around a project better than. Uh, better than others, then we, that, that's where we typically will find the returns. I mean, the other challenge here is, well, in developing markets, there's not enough capital going. In developed markets, uh, there, there is almost too much capital chasing core infrastructure, in our view. So the core infrastructure, there's more and more in global investors who are trying to allocate money to infrastructure. Uh, and whether it's through funds or direct, uh, prices have got uh, you know, very, very uh, extended um, in core infrastructure in, in developed markets. So that they have a, that, that's a different challenge for us. So uh, we're, we're trying to find uh, more um, interesting opportunities away from just pure core infrastructure in developed markets. So going forward, is it possible for there to be new and more innovative capital structures, ways of, of doing this so that at the end of the day, you get a decent you know, risk return ratio and at the end of the day, that capital you're talking about actually moves to the areas which require it the most, and where obviously the return will also be more. Make, are there are they, are they intelligent ways of doing this? I know you uh, don't tell us all your secret sauce, but maybe there are some ways of. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure we have a secret sauce on, uh, on capital structures. I mean, this, the, the, the two sweeping things on that are one that um, I think the, what we want is the, are the cash flows from the projects. And if, if it's a very complicated capital structure, uh, then that actually will in, probably inhibit the refinancing of it in the long term and will just cause additional complexity in the long term. So we, we prefer you know, a, a more simple capital structure uh, where ownership's clear and you know, risk mitigation is clear and, and risk insurance is clear. And, and it's going to be stable for a very long term. Um, so that, that's, uh, that, that's one thing I'd say to, uh, so it's, I don't think it's all about financial engineering. I think it's about uh, the mitigation of the risks and the ownership of the clear ownership of the risks. So the government owns some risks, private sector owns the other risks, the very clear mitigation, and the framework stays in place for the very long term. Uh, so I think that, that, that's, the, that's the major point I'd make on that. Right. Would you like to add something to that, or are there innovative financial structures that you can think of? No, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, we more or less have all have the same uh, fundamentals and basic around that. So, uh, I mean, I concur with, uh, with what you said. Nothing to add. Lakanaka? Are there new financial and other structures that you can see which would make an impact? Uh, 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 besides uh, safety and security, besides, I think uh, uh, the old buildings, all the bridge will be 
uh, increasing rapidly in all over the world. And if we could uh, uh, use a robot, uh, very difficult to see directly. Uh, instead of human beings, uh, we could use a robot, or we could use an X-ray uh, to see the inside. And that kind of uh, innovation should be applied to the uh, old infrastructures uh, replacing. And, uh, and that could be uh, a good uh, investment for the security and safety in the world. All right. Professor Keta, um, any, any new uh, financial or other ways? Uh, any, what, for example, when investors come to meet you, you're in China, if somebody was to come in and meet you, what essentially was the is the final key message that you are you're really giving them? When we meet with uh, Chinese investors, uh, we usually had a good talk. So we congratulate China on being our good partner. If they are involved in the concession project in our country, the project usually uh, moves ahead with a little uh, headwind. And for us, we need to identify for the concession holder and the non-concession holder uh, what is their motivation to be involved in the project. It's not friendship. We need to be uh, economic. We need to make sure everyone else uh, also gets a piece of the profit. So that's the first uh, structure we need to consider. Also, we need to think about what we need. Is it the money, uh, say, five uh, billion? Every day, we need to mobilize funds. So uh, if you add, it up, uh, add everything up, it's a lot of money. So the investment uh, need for Mali, uh, as I said, we are still an inland country, landlocked country. So we need to find a way to get to the coast. So we should remain vigilant. And uh, we need a lot of uh, capital uh, supply. Of course, if uh, there's more that you invest, then there's more uh, likely more return for you. So we put a lot of hope on developing private sector as a partner to us. And we are uh, trying to uh, innovate uh, with the investment model to attract more private investment for countries in Africa as a whole. Uh, our banks also want to uh, work with you to replenish their capital so that they can also get more money to uh, fund growth in Africa. In Mali, I want to say um, we have the River Niger, and ships can uh, cross the river. So it's a very important uh, transportation link. So we're working with uh, countries such as China. We're trying to uh, rehabilitate the river and make it more productive. And also irrigation, because uh, of the sludge which is building up in the river bed, on the river bed. The river is getting shallower and narrower. So the, um, the land that we have, the farmland that we have, cannot be uh, sufficiently irrigated. Also, hydropower is another thing that we want to focus on. So all these projects are related to uh, people's livelihood, and they are long-term. And uh, that's why we want to find different solutions and use uh, a variety of innovative uh, models to uh, fund the projects. Despite all the challenges that we have, we believe we will be able to find 
more investment. As my uh, colleague said, uh, maybe we can think about some of the uh, innovative uh, structures uh, and how do we work with uh, Niger and Senegal uh, to build like cross-border uh, railways uh, from uh, Dakar to Niger. Railways are also very important and they are the lifeline of uh, our uh, country because the railways can help us transport uh, minerals, uh, iron ores, so Chinese and the French uh, investors are uh, very much encouraged to talk to us. And uh, we are also uh, breaking down uh, the investment projects into two phases. And in each phase, we are exploring the feasibility of bringing more investment from abroad. A competition for capital, or is that already started off? Because, we are, I mean, across Africa, there's a lot of capital that is being sought. Uh, countries like India, we hear that could be one one point <coughs> seven trillion dollars required in infrastructure over the next few years. So clearly, there's a lot of demand. There is there enough capital going around, or no? Um, More. I think <laughs> this, this, is the, this is the sixty trillion dollar question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, theoretically, there's enough capital, um, and you know there, there's you know so, but. I, you know, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds are not going to put sixty, put all of their money into infrastructure and all their money into developing market infrastructure. I mean, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that given the right uh, risk mitigation techniques and uh, the development. I mean, I think what governments have to do is develop the pipeline. This has been talked about for the last two years a lot. So I think if governments can create, you know, well thought out, well supported, shovel ready, financing ready projects. Uh, and work with the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, IFC, all, all these agencies, the, and political risk insurance to put in place proper financing structures, then, then I'm quite optimistic the money will flow. I think governments also need to just pool their expertise. It's often spread across lots of ministries if it can be pulled in, in one place, one center of excellence that really understands how to put together these infrastructure projects. That, that again, makes life a lot easier for investors. And then also, as was talked earlier, the collaboration with the private sector, allowing a process where private sector investors can come and make proposals. And you know, Chile's held out as an example of this, where uh, Chile, if, if, if the proposal actually is adopted, then uh, all those costs of developing that, uh, that idea are, are repaid. And, and the person who's also developed it you know, gets, uh, gets extra points when they're bidding for the project as well so in their assessment. So that type of collaboration and, and, and Const and, and actually uh, formalizing is very good. I think find, you know, the, the World Economic Forum documents uh, of, you know, uh, give Alex again a shout out on this. I think they're absolutely excellent in summarizing best practice for, uh, for infrastructure development for governments. Alex is going to leave a stack of them around for all of us to, <laughs> to take out with us. We almost had a time, maybe a quick final thought, you know, enough capital you feel and enough good projects going around as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm sharing what Mark said just now. I mean, I think there is enough capital in terms of equity for the project. Uh, but pro what, what is really uh, very expensive today is, is, uh, is to finance the development cost. And, and the development costs are, are, are higher and higher because we try to make things very complex. Uh, and we, if we keep, if we try to find a mechanism between the, the public and the private sector uh, to keep things very simple at the development phase, I fully agree that we have enough equity for the, pro for the capital cost of the project itself. And, uh, and the only thing is that we need to reduce the development cost, not to increase unduly the, 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 the capital cost of the project. So I think it's, 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 it's one of the key for the development of the infrastructure project in the, in, in the coming years. Okay, anyway, budget, from you. budget is limited. So uh, how to decrease the investment is quite important. And uh, mm. Toshiba is, uh, so in that case, Innovation is a very, very important role, so uh, Toshiba could be helpful for, for that. <laughs> so please use Toshiba's products. <laughs> all, right. all right, on that note, thank you all so much for being out here. It's a $60 trillion question or whatever. We certainly hope that infrastructure continues to, to, to roll out in all countries around the world, and it's a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.